Hi, my name is Ron Eiler. I'm a professor of radiology at, at New York University in New York. Um, I am a musculoskeletal radiologist uh, and I have a strong background in ultrasound and I wanted to share with you today my experience uh, now in three different institutions in starting up a musculoskeletal ultrasound practice. Uh, uh, I think this is really important. There's a tremendous amount of interest in musculoskeletal ultrasound and uh, I think uh, uh, the experience that I bring from three different institutions uh, may be of value if, that's, if this is something you like to incorporate in your, in your uh, ongoing radiology practice. Hi, so I'd like to speak to you today about incorporating musculoskeletal sonography into your practice and basically I'd like to give you sort of my own personal account in terms of how I've been able to do this in three different institutions and hopefully that will serve as a guide for you in, in terms of the kinds of things that you may have to deal with uh, in, in doing this. Uh, as far as disclosures are concerned, I do have research and educational collaborations with Siemens Medical Systems. Uh, so, we're going to talk about today several different areas. Um, first of all, is it doable? Is it, uh, and, it, and the answer, of course, is yes, uh, and I'm going to share my experience with you in terms of doing, starting up these kinds of practices. Why is it important for us as radiologists to do this? Um, some common misconceptions as to why some people are reluctant to incorporate ultrasound into their musculoskeletal practice. And, and finally, how to do it. And there is a very nice article in the literature that I'd like to bring to your attention that the, describes this technique for those of you who'd like to uh, uh, go into this in a little more detail. So where's my experience uh, from? Well, I've been at three different institutions. Uh, started out at the University of Michigan. Uh, I was there from 89 to 97, which is a large academic medical center, single large hospital-based practice. Uh, moved on from there to Hospital for Special Surgery, was there from 98 to 2012. This is a different kind of setting, it's an orthopedic subspecialty hospital. Uh, again, it's a hospital-based practice, but a very specialized uh, type of practice, uh, basically uh, dealing with musculoskeletal diseases. And finally, now I'm at NYU Langone Medical Center, um, which again is a large academic medical center. However, working in an outpatient setting, for the most part, uh, where we do the majority of our, uh, of our uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound, and uh, although there is a hospital-based practice associated with us as well, Hospital for Joint Disease, which is the associated orthopedic hospital. But the large majority of ultrasound we do is in, in this outpatient center. So let's go through that background uh, to give you a sense of what the scenario was in, in, in these different types of situations. And you also have to put in perspective that the time uh, at which these uh, practices occurred is very different. So the view, the general view of people of uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound back in the, in the early 90s, late 80s was very different from what it is currently. So we have to put it in perspective of time as well as location. So before 1989, uh, when I was just beginning as a uh, faculty, uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound was effectively non-existent within the university. However, by 1997, we were actually doing 25 to 30 exams per week. It was the, the examinations were done by the musculoskeletal interventional radiologists. Uh, I had trained four technologists to perform diagnostic exams and assistant interventions. And uh, all these exams were ba basically performed in the main ultrasound lab. In 1998, when I moved on to the Hospital for Special Surgery, the first year I was there, we did 1,500 examinations. And if you look at this breakdown over here, about 500 of those were musculoskeletal at that point. But you could see uh, over the past several following years that there was a rapid growth in musculoskeletal ultrasound. By 2000, it was about 100% increase. By 2002, we we're actually doing over 500 cases a month. Uh, we had two high-end machines and we had three techs at that point and it was a proposed expansion. And then finally, the last, uh, by the time I was leaving, we were actually doing over a thousand cases per month. About 50% of those were all interventional. We had four high-end machines, six technologists in four rooms. And then finally, my current experience, uh, and this is in the environment uh, where musculoskeletal ultrasound has really caught on fire in a, in not only in radiology, certainly, but in a number of different areas, such as emergency medicine. But even in that kind of setting, uh, you could see that with we have two high-end machines, we have two technologists, 
The exams are performed by uh, the interventional radiologists, and our numbers have increased significantly uh, from, from when I started about 200 to over 400 cases per month, and, and that number is, uh, is rapidly increasing. So I think you could see that it's certainly very doable in different settings and different scenarios. So, uh, and I know everybody needs to individualize according to the place that they're at, but, uh, but it certainly is a very doable thing. Um, so why is it important for us as radiologists to do it? Well, there is, of course, increase in clinical demand, and we'll talk about that a little more about that in a minute. Non-radiologists will do it and are doing it, and so if we don't do it, then we're, it's really one of those areas that we will lose as, as uh, imagers. Uh, it does provide a new revenue source if you don't already have it incorporated in your practice. Uh, I think it is in keeping with our expertise as, uh, uh, as multidisciplinary or multimodality imagers, uh, uh, where we really have uh, tremendous expertise in, in a variety of different Im imaging areas as well as ultrasound. And, uh, and it, I think probably most importantly, it makes us a visible member of the clinical team, and we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Okay, well, there is tremendous increased clinical demand for doing musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, one way we've been able to adapt to this is by uh, incorporating same-day add-ons in our practice. Uh, when I was at uh, Hospital for Special Surgery, this amounted to taking as many as 10 to 20 cases on per day. It's something we can, we can do fairly easily in ultrasound, whereas if you're going to a schedule for something like an MR, sometimes it could be a several week waiting uh, list. So, that, uh, so these are exams that we can do and we can often, oftentimes offer same day service to the patients. Uh, see them and treat them in the same day, which is quite significant. Uh, at NYU, that number is about four to eight today in our current experience, although that seems to be increasing as well. And there are a variety of different clinical services that are really impacted by our, uh, um, by our offering this service. Um, uh, in my experience, uh, the, I ba basically have dealt with all these t types of uh, uh, clinical services, probably orthopedic surgeons, non-surgical sports medicine, rheumatology, probably among the largest of these groups, but certainly have dealt with all these individuals. And, uh, and once you offer that service to them, uh, they will be more than happy to oblige you by, uh, by uh, giving you um, uh, referrals. Now, as I mentioned before, there has been increasing interest uh, by non-radiologists in performing ultrasound. And, uh, and just a quote from an article, and this is back in 2001 that appeared in the rheumatology literature, uh, by an Italian rheumatologist, no less. Uh, ultrasound is a safe, cheap, and powerful tool for evaluating soft tissue involvement in rheumatic uh, diseases and should be regarded as an extension of the bedside clinical examination, which is certainly one reason that uh, non-radiologists are interested in performing it. Uh, and then, of course, the, the follow-up statement, the simplicity and reliability of the technique might warn rheumatologists to undergo sonographic training. So this is really the lead into the non-radiologists doing this type of imaging. Uh, I have on the right here a slide uh, or a graph that was uh, in an article that actually Dr. Nazarian was a co-author on um, uh, in the Journal of American College of Radiology. This is in 2012, and it looks at trends of uh, utilization for ultrasound for dust diagnostic purposes. Um, and you can see uh, among radiologists, this top blue curve over here, it's rapidly increasing, but if you look at non-radiologists, it's also significantly increasing. In fact, if you, look at, if you were to look at the total numbers of non-radiologists doing over relative to radiologists, their numbers actually exceed uh, the num number of exams performed by radiologists. So we see it's a, there's clearly a lot of interest for non-radiologists in doing it. And uh, as a result of that, musculoskeletal ultrasound performed by non-radiologists is in fact here to say and so it is something we have to deal with in the future. So the question is, how can we work in that type of environment? Uh, I think there are a number of reasons for, for this interest. Of course, there, there, as I indicated before with the, with the Italian radiologists, uh, rheumatologists, excuse me, there was already precedent set outside of the United States for non-radiologists performing ultrasound. Um, there has been, in recent years, a proliferation of inexpensive, uh, portable, relatively high-quality ultrasound scanners, so-called laptop scanners, and so it's become much less, uh, uh, much more affordable for, for these uh, individuals to obtain ultrasound equipment and, and really obtain relatively high-quality images. It's, of course, a new source of revenue, which is something we all think about. 
Uh, there are numerous courses out there, websites and so forth, that are available to non-radiologists. Uh, I know I've had, uh, as far as observers, uh, non-radiologists come to uh, our institution at HSS, and I, I know some of my colleagues have had the same experience as well. And, it, and of course, it's been integrated into part of their fellowship training, uh, such as in emergency, emergency medicine and rheumatology for, are two good examples of that. So they're really... Uh, it's really incorporated into their training currently. So the bottom line is if, if we're not doing it, then we will lose it because uh, there's certainly a lot of interest in others, by others to, to do it as well. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, there is enhanced revenue. Uh, and as we all know, procedures pay. And I would say the large percentage of the exams that we do are, are in fact, interventional. Uh, and great... Uh, Interventional procedures are greater than 50% of our current musculoskeletal ultrasound uh, uh, service, which, is an out, which are predominantly performed as outpatient exams. There are a variety of different procedures that we do in terms of aspirations and injections. Uh, we inject and aspirate it, uh, inject a number of different substances. Uh, I would say the majority of uh, about uh, MR arthrograms that I do, and, and probably half of uh, the MR arthrograms that we do in our department are perform injected under ultrasound guidance, and there are a variety of other newer procedures that are very amenable to ultrasound, such as tenotomy, platelet-rich plasma therapy, stem cell injections, and so forth, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as other procedures that are very conducive to ultrasound guidance. Um, now, we are, as radiologists, uh, uh, the imaging experts, or, uh, and we have experience in multiple different areas. Uh, it's, uh, we can go cross easily from boundaries, uh, from areas such as uh, magnetic resonance imaging to ultrasound and, and really need to utilize that expertise. And we do utilize that expert, expertise when we perform a variety of examinations and, and musculoskeletal ultrasound is, is no different. Uh, people come out with fellowship training and with a deep now with a sense of knowledge in musculoskeletal anatomy and pathology. We have multimodality expertise. There are many fellowship programs, or certainly substantially increased number of fellowship programs that uh, incorporate both ultrasound and MR in their training. We know how to optimize our images. We develop, learn scan techniques. And we're also trained to do a variety of image-guided interventions. And so it's very much in keeping with us as radiologists that we be doing both uh, ultrasound as well as uh, other modalities that we normally incorporate into our practice. And of course, we need to keep in mind that ultrasound in and of itself has a series of unique imaging capabilities. We can perform provocative maneuvers, as in this particular case, where uh, a patient comes in with an ulnar neuropathy, and we can see that this, uh, with provocative maneuvers, uh, this triceps muscle over here is pushing the ulnar nerve over the medial epicondyle, and so we can understand why he has his ulnar neuropathy. And this type of provocative uh, test is really unique to ultrasound. And of course, when we do uh, ultrasound guided procedures, we can have direct visualization of the needle and, and the injected material, as in this particular case, where we have a needle in a ganglion cyst along the dorsal aspect of the ankle, and we're looking at the injected material as it goes in, so we know we're getting in the right area. So there are a variety of reasons why ultrasound really would play a uh, uh, a unique role in, in our imaging capabilities in and of itself. And finally, it avoids imaging that may be pro prohibitive or simply overkill. A uh, patient comes in with a bump in the dorsal back of his wrist or a bump in his elbow, and the question is, is there a ganglion cyst or some other type of soft tissue swelling? This is a simple target examination. It doesn't necessarily require that the patient go on for more advanced imaging. So here we have an example of a patient that had soft tissue swelling over his elbow. Uh, if you're looking in a subcutaneous fat, you see this well-encapsulated echogenic uh, mass over here. And this is fairly typical for a subcutaneous lipoma. And this is a five-minute examination. Fairly easy determination to make. Or we can see uh, pathology in the setting of uh, indwelling hardware, which may be difficult to evaluate with other types of imaging modalities, such as CT or MR, where there's either streak artifact or susceptibility artifact. Where in this case, we have a patient that had a, had, had a wrist fracture, has a volar plate, and we can see a threaded screw projecting through the posterior cortex of the radius, uh, uh, impinging on one of the extensor tendons of the wrist as being the source of the wrist pain. So this is a determination that would be difficult to make any other way. 
And of course, uh, we were all aware of the fact that not everybody is amenable to having MRs uh, or CTs, uh, particularly MR in the case of a lot of soft tissue abnormalities, uh, if there's a pacemaker, aneurysm, cliff, and so forth. So ultrasound really serves a purpose of, of an additional modality to address some of these issues. I think most importantly, the radiologist becomes a visible member of the clinical team. I think there's an altered perception of, uh, by the patient as well as the clinicians in terms, of, uh, in terms of how they view the radiologist. The radiologist is not simply someone who sits in the reading room uh, with the lights turned off uh, and just uh, looking at reading his, film, reading his films. Uh, uh, it allows us direct hands-on contact with the patients. The patients will view the radiologist as being one of the people who are helping to treat their pain. I think it uh, promotes a much higher level of visibility for radiologists within both the hospital as well as the community. And so the ultrasound person becomes part of the clinical, uh, ultrasound then becomes part of the clinical algorithm in treating a number of problems. And, that, and that's been my general experience uh, at, at all the institutions I've been at. So there have been some common misconceptions, I mean, from way back when that I, that I remember discussing this with various people as to why we should be doing ultrasound. Uh, one of them, of course, it negatively impacts our MR volume. It may take a long time to do. It's operator dependent, therefore it's unreliable. Uh, it can be hard to learn and the images may be difficult for clinicians to relate to. Well, let's look at some of these. Uh, in my experience, uh, this has not been the case as far as negatively impacting MR. When I was at special surgery, uh, our MR volume in 2001 had actually grown 65%. Uh, there was a hospital approval to expand to a, higher, a larger number of uh, high field strength systems. By the time I was leaving in 2012, uh, we had actually had 10 high field strength uh, magnets and doing approximately 2,400 examinations per month. And uh, NYU, even in the setting of uh, Hurricane Sandy that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, we're still doing about 2,000 exams per month, uh, which is uh, basically back to our pre-hurricane uh, limit uh, numbers. And uh, there's really been no significant impact on our MR volume, certainly by the presence of doing musculoskeletal ultrasound. So it's really had no negative impact, at least in my experience, in terms of our, or in terms of our MR volume. Now, does it take a long time to do? Well, the time it takes really varies in the type of examination. Many of the types of exams we do in ultrasound are clearly targeted examinations, so, such as evaluation of soft tissue swelling in the wrist, for instance. Uh, many of these exams can be done in, in five minutes or less. Uh, some of the exams can be done by a technologist uh, with either minimal or no uh, involvement by the radiologist at all. You simply look at the images, and if it's fairly straightforward, oftentimes you can simply uh, sit down and dictate a report based on that. Um, and uh, there, are, there clearly are exams where the radiologist must get involved. For instance, when we do shoulder ultrasounds, those are somewhat more extensive. But even in those situations, uh, a lot of the preliminary scanning can be done by a technologist, and the radiologist can then uh, perhaps go in and, and post-scan the patient uh, in a more targeted fashion and, and not have to necessarily spend a lot of time. And I know in my, in my situation, I generally don't spend more than about five minutes with these patients after I've gotten an initial study from my, from my techs. And, and uh, one thing that's generally true is once I'm in there scanning the patient, I've usually pretty much come to uh, a decision as to what the pathology is. And so it's, uh, you can almost dictate these exams on the fly. When, when you're doing them. Now, interventions can take a somewhat longer time to, to do. Uh, the majority of, uh, of the interventions we do, we generally pay, put these patients in a 30-minute time slot. Uh, there are certain exceptions that can take longer, uh, cryoblations, PRPs, uh, but these are really exams that uh, some of these interventions are fairly unique to ultrasound and would be difficult to do almost any other way except perhaps using, for instance, computer tomography in certain instances. Um, of many cases, we do interventions in addition to either diagnostic ultrasound or some other diagnostic examination. So we're doing it usually as, as, uh, in conjunction with some other types of diagnostic imaging that's already been done. Uh, there are various things you can do to help facilitate these procedures. You can have dedicated interventional rooms, uh, uh, and, and you really, I, I really encourage you to work closely with your uh, with your technologists, your nurses, uh, in really trying to optimize uh, and facilitate uh, these procedures to be done. In, in many situations, the actual radiologist involvement can be reduced significantly. In some cases, down to as little as five to ten minutes, depending on what type of procedure you're doing. 
Now we've all heard the all heard the comments that musculoskeletal ultrasound is very operator dependent, and I would actually put forth that basically all imaging is operator dependent. Uh, we've all had the experience of seeing poorly performed MRs, CTs, arthrograms, and so forth. It really depends on on how those exams are being performed. All all imaging requires training in terms of doing it appropriately. Uh, and of course, in the right setting with the right amount of training, we know there are already numerous publications out there that show that can be high levels of inter and intra observer reliability for musculoskeletal ultrasound, just there as there is in other types of imaging. So it, once you once you have adequate training, there's no question that you can do it well, and there's a lot of uh, evidence to support that. So how is is it hard to learn? Can you can you teach a tech to do it? Well, I think one of the things that's helpful is um, uh, it's always helpful since there is a lot of expertise out there in the current environment. Uh, most people with expertise are very, very happy to consult with others who are, uh, uh, who are looking to start their practices. Um, I think uh, with the number of fellowship trained uh, uh, MSK radiologists coming out of, uh, coming out of uh, various uh, training programs, uh, there's certainly the opportunity to hire people with experience already, uh, and it's usually good to assign that individual, if you, if you hire such a person as a point person, uh, to really help promote the uh, uh, instruction of musculoskeletal ultrasound within your, own, within your own practice. One of the things that I find helpful is to, uh, is to establish small group training sessions. Uh, and basically what I mean by that is uh, you know, meeting on a weekly basis or, or bi-weekly basis where you meet with a group of people, either uh, uh, technologists or uh, people working with you, other radiologists, and basically practice on one another, having someone demonstrate uh, the normal uh, techniques for scanning and then uh, allowing people to practice on one another. So they really get, get a comfort level in terms of doing these types of examination. And in my experience, as I mentioned before, when I was at U of M, we, I was able to train four techs to, to function quite well. Uh, HSS, I had trained six techs, and, and now at NYU I already have two technologists trained. So it's certainly very doable. I can't stress the importance of education and in the current environment, there are many different opportunities to receive either uh, didactic as well as hands-on education through a number of organizations. Uh, observerships are available at a number of institutions where that have well-established musculoskeletal ultrasound programs. Currently, there are a number of good textbooks and publications out there. There are well web-based learning tools as well as a number of published guidelines for performing musculoskeletal ultrasound that are out in the literature. So I would uh, strongly encourage everybody to, to uh, uh, access uh, these, uh, some of these resources. And are the images difficult to relate to? Well, uh, if we think of ultrasound as just being a small field of view image uh, uh, of obscure part of anatomy, then maybe that's the case, but I, I think uh, there are a number of things you can do to help uh, uh, clarify what the ultrasound images look like. Uh, I think part of it has to do with educating yourself and your colleagues, correlating whenever possible with MR and CT so they get used to looking at the ultrasound anatomy uh, in respect to other ty the, the same anatomy seen on other imaging modalities. Uh, it's good to integrate the, this into your clinical conferences as much as possible. Uh, I always encourage people to scan meticulously, uh, particularly with a musculoskeletal uh, ultrasound where, the, where knowledge of the anatomy is very important. Label your images so people know what you're looking at. Um, and I, I think extended field view imaging, particularly in this setting, is, it can be very helpful because it gives you sort of a nice gestalt view of the anatomy. So in some sense, it's sort of looking uh, like, uh, like looking at an MR scan. Uh, and I find clinicians can relate to these types of images much more easily. So again, you know, just using some of these different uh, features when you're, whenever you're trying to uh, present ultrasound, musculoskeletal ultrasound to, uh, to an audience can be, can be very helpful. So how do we start a musculoskeletal ultrasound practice? Well, I've alluded to education as being one of those, uh, one, of, one of the factors that are involved. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Logistics, of course, in terms of how you set it up, uh, people you speak to, and, and I think very importantly, and something we, we don't do well as radiologists, but something we, we need to do, particularly in the current environment, is advertise ourselves, basically. How do you promote it um, within, uh, within the literature? How do you promote it within your local hospital setting and so forth? 
Um, this is an example of one of the things that I started um, uh, at HSS and, and we're continuing at NYU is a so-called ultrasound of the month, something that we have out there either in the intranet or in, the, in our regular uh, uh, or local intranet. Um, and um, this basically as much as an, of an educational tool for various people um, as well as for clinicians basically to indicate to them of what we're capable of doing in ultrasound. So it presents a, an interesting clinical scenario uh, along with the corresponding ultrasound images that, as, well, as well as a diagnosis. So they really get a sense of what we can do. So educating your colleagues is very important. Uh, one way to do this is uh, to attend staff conferences, educate your radiology con uh, colleagues within the context of your clinical, uh, your, your uh, your um, local conferences, talk to clinicians, attend their conferences as much as possible, let them know what you can do, determine their specific interests, where their interests lie, so you can get a sense as to what's important to them and where you might be able to add to, their pro to what's important to them in terms of, uh, in terms of ultrasound. Uh, as I mentioned uh, several times already, offering to take add-on patients can be very important, um, uh, really pr improves the quality of the uh, the, the quality of medical care that they can offer. And, and I think once you start offering this service to them, uh, they'll, they'll actually start utilizing you quite a bit more. Uh, whenever you have an opportunity to talk at the clinical conferences, the showcases, um, so people can get a sense as to what uh, the various types of pathology looks like and you can see the kinds of things that you can do. And uh, at least in my own experience, for, for those of you who work in academic institutions, research collaborations can be very helpful. Uh, when you start such collaboration, oftentimes uh, you bring clinicians in, they begin to see what you can do, and then next thing you find out is that they're actually starting to make uh, referrals of various types of clinical uh, exams for you as well. So that's uh, actually one, one handy way to, to, to start such a, um, to, to get a set of referrals. So the, as I mentioned before, in educating your colleagues, uh, setting up a website can be very helpful. Uh, these can be uh, cases of the month, as I mentioned before. They can be how-to manuals in terms of how to do various types of scans, such as shoulder, elbow, and so forth. They can be uh, interventional type of web pages, and we, we've had experience doing both of these, and there, there are a number of good websites out there already from various, uh, from various institutions, uh, such as University of Michigan, for instance, uh, that really have a lot of information in terms of doing musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, you can set images up on your local web page, which is the ultrasound of the month, as I mentioned before, which offers a clinical synopsis and, and a few relevant images to help educate uh, not only your colleagues, but also the, the clinicians within the institution so they can see the kinds of things that you can do with, uh, with ultrasound. Now finally, uh, logistics become very important. Um, so once you have the interest, obviously you have to, you have to uh, uh, do the administer you have to uh, know where you can set up such a uh, uh, such a uh, ex how you can incorporate this easily into your practice um, uh, and uh, one way to do that is uh, working with your administrative staff to know how best to uh, schedule these uh, types of examinations how to code them and how to bill for them to, in order to incorporate them into your practice uh, working with your clinical colleagues and nurses and technologists, as I said, are, it can be very important. It, it sort of, you can help determine the types of exams you can do, the necessary workspace uh, that, uh, that you will require it in order to perform ultrasound, where the, where the, where the workspace should be located, and, and get a sense of how it will work into your, uh, your already existing workflow. Uh, and as I mentioned, since there is a lot of expertise out there already, it's, uh, most people um, are very amenable to, uh, as I am, for instance, uh, uh, to be contacted either by email or by, by phone, and, and you can certainly ask some questions in terms of, uh, since you already have an established practice, um, you, know, you know, kinds of things that would be very helpful for you to consider when you want to incorporate it into your own practice. I've indicated in this slide a number of common CPT codes that we use for, uh, for both diagnostic and interventional examinations. Uh, and uh, just uh, these are some of the numbers, uh, some of the CPT codes that we find very useful and uh, that we're currently using for billing these examinations. And, and finally, it's very important once you want to set up a practice is to learn how to promote it. And of course, conferences is one way to do it. 
But advertising can be very helpful. This could be advertising through web-based uh, through web-based means, uh, such as uh, ultrasound of the month, for instance. Uh, you can have brochures that you distribute, um, both uh, available within uh, at your um, within your practice when patients come in that, that they can access, or uh, brochures that you mail out. Uh, we've sent out letters to referring clinicians to let them know the kinds of services that we offer, including ultrasound. And as I mentioned before, being available uh, to take add-on cases can be very helpful because it's one way of promoting the service and at the same time letting cl clinicians know you're out there and you can take their patients on, on the same day for certain types of uh, procedures. It's important to stress the complementary role of ultrasound with other types of imaging modalities so that, uh, and part of this is so that your colleagues know when they're reading an MR scan what types of examinations might be appropriate to refer for ultrasound guided. So for instance, in this case, there's a patient with a meniscal cyst seen on uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and this was very conducive to an ultrasound guided aspiration and injection. So once you see this, then you know that this can follow, and it's a very nice way to treat these uh, examinations. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, there are examinations that necessarily aren't conducive to either MR or CT, so be aware of this when you discuss uh, ways of dealing with uh, various types of abnormalities with clinicians. You can keep that in mind and know which patients would be appropriate to go on for ultrasound examination. And, and so that's another way to help build up a referral basis. So we've spoken about a number of things uh, in terms of studying up your ultrasound practice. Uh, uh, what I'd like to stress is that a musculoskeletal ultrasound is an important service to offer for a variety of reasons, as we've discussed. And, and, and importantly, if we don't do it, we will lose it. Uh, it is doable. Just educate yourself and your colleagues so uh, they know what's appropriate and, and they can sort of relate to these images. Uh, if need be, start simple. Just think of the kinds of things that you feel comfortable doing. Uh, in terms of uh, starting out with, but um, uh, and I think you'll you'll notice that once you start getting some confidence, you can expand to more complex types of procedures. Uh, I think being available to take on add-ons can be very helpful, and very importantly, advertise. Um, I can't stress that enough, uh, so people know what it is you're doing. I think you, once you've done this, you'll find that musculoskeletal ultrasound will enhance your radiology practice, and I think you, you'll be surprised to see what kind of impact you have on medicine, uh, how it's done in an institution, and you'll become a more valued member of the, of the clinical team. So uh, I'd like to leave you with this. There's no time to lose. Call and find out about starting your musculoskeletal ultrasound practice today. Thank you very much.